because before we start singing, it's always cold. By the time we get done, it's always warm. <laughs> we were here for two hours beforehand, and it was always cold. So, I figure it's God. I'm going to be talking some today about being all in. I'm going to be talking some today about the grace of God, some today about the mercy of God, some today about all kinds of different things. As God wills, we will go them a ways. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. Matthew 28, 16. Everybody knows the scripture. Hopefully you have it memorized somewhere. <clears throat> Down in your brain or back in your brain. This is the Great Commission. Hallelujah. So right before we get into the word, let's pray. By the way, Larry, Myra, hi. <laughs> Who else is there, Regina? Marissa, hi. <laughs> They watch us on YouTube. Pan around, show them everybody that's here, Joe. <laughs> Say hi, everybody. Hi. 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 That's right. Now, you all, you other guys out there, that you know, tell us that we're watching. We'll say hi. We'll be like Joel Olstein. <laughs> I want to thank you for tuning in today. <clears throat> I gotta have like this long bushy black hair and just white teeth, man. I looked at that guy and just got this beautiful smile, you know. It's amazing. Well, there in Matthew 28, we're gonna pray. Father, I thank you today that we are who we are. You've chose us as we are. If I was supposed to have long, black, wavy hair, I'd have long, black, wavy hair. And I thank you, God, that I'm unique. I am different than anybody else. And I thank you, God, everybody in this place is unique and different from everybody else. We can do what we do uh, better than anybody else can do it because we are us. And we thank you, Lord, for making us who we are. Jesus, it was you that put us in the family we were in. It is you that raised us up. It's you that put us in the relationships we're in. I thank you, God, we've made some terrible mistakes, but you, have, your grace has covered us all. Amen. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Matthew, the 28th chapter, the 16th verse we'll start in. We'll go through the last of the chapter. It says, Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. I, he shouldn't have threw that in there. Do you think? I mean, here is the resurrected Christ. They've seen him a couple times. They watched him be crucified. He died. He was really dead. They bled and all that. And here he is, all cool. It's only days later now. You can't get whipped 39 times and crucified and hung on a cross and beat up like that and look good the next day. That's only Hollywood. You can't do that. The next day, his eyes would have been all swelled shut. His back would have been bruised and goofed up. He would have been barely able to walk. So three days later, he could not have done this, even if they wanted to do this to him. Okay, let's go on here. Some doubt it. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given unto me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, Amen. baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, as we're getting to the next part, turn to 1 Timothy with me. Now, that is the, that is the Great Commission, correct? Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. No, that isn't the one I wanted. Praise the Lord. Especially verse 2. Yes, this is it. In the second chapter of 1 Timothy says, Therefore I exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, and intercession, and giving of thanks be made for all men, Amen. for kings, for all who are in authority. Next time you start mouthing out about the leaders, check it out. 
all those in authority, how, why? That we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. Now watch this. He says, go therefore make disciples of all nations. Now we know why, now we know why we make disciples of all nations. Now we know why we teach the ways of the kingdom to our neighbors and to those abroad and to those we go into the mission field for. Now we know why we witness to people we meet. This is why we pray about people, about kings. Why? For their sakes, yes, that they might come into the kingdom. But for our sakes, that we might live a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. You see that? Not only for the sake of those coming into the kingdom, but for our sake. I want you to know that they don't know. They don't know the principles of the kingdom. Look around. I wrote down here. It, 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 okay. They are cutting people's heads off on TV and think that they are doing the right thing for God. They don't know. They are strapping C4 to their chest and blowing themselves up and other innocent peoples because they actually think they are doing the right thing. Why do we go into all the world and preach the gospel? Not only for their sakes, but for ours. I want you to know this world is in the shape it's in because of the godliness, godlessness of the world. As we go into the world and preach all the gospel, when, the, when a hundred years ago in this country... 200 years ago, 300 years ago, in this country, we had a country full of Christians. Full of people who thought just like we do. Full of people who knew that forgiveness was a way and not vengeance. Amen. That knew that love was a way and not hate. That knew that you don't lie to people, ever. You don't lie. People who knew you didn't lie. People don't know that now. In national politics, they lie all the time. And then they think it's okay. <laughs> Some of the, these national politics and world politics actually lie and think they're stupid if they don't lie. If you don't lie to them, try to get away with it. Just lie. Buy a little time. So we get the nukes in order. <laughs> you know? What do you think Iran is doing? Jeez. Let's, let's go down here. I'm sorry, I get, get a little carried away here. Because most Americans are just sleeping in their nice little bubble that they're in in America and thinking we're not at war. We're at war, people. These people won't kill us. That's what they want. Iran right now is making uh, technology to get, the, get their bombs over to the east coast of the United States. Right now. Well, Israel, yeah, Israel's about this big. Let's see the map of North Africa and the uh, Middle East is about this big. Israel is about the biggest of my little fingernail. And every one of those countries around there are pointing their guns at them. Their only place of peace and tranquility in the whole Middle East. Did you know that? I'm serious. That's, that's the way it is. It's amazing. It's amazing. And, and uh, uh, anyway, I'll go on. Someone said that the safest place for a Christian is in Israel. Yeah. Yeah. Jerusalem's safer than Portland, Oregon. That's just statistics. These are just statistics people put out. I don't know. Safer than Portland, Oregon. Why? Because they actually, Isra the Israelites actually believe in human rights. Actually believe in it. They don't just say they believe in it. They actually believe in it. And in fact, before they make an attack on anybody in Syria or the Gaza Strip or those guys that are shooting mockers at them all the time, before they strike, they have a whole task force of Israeli guys that speak the language of the people across there. They call them up on the phone the night before and says, we're going to bomb your neighborhood in the morning. You better take a vacation. And then if they don't answer, they back it up with a text and say, get out of town, baby. They're trying to protect the children of the enemy while the enemy is taking their children and put them up to protect their bombs. Israel is doing everything in its power to protect civilians and children from bombs and their enemies are trying to put the children in the way to protect their bombs. This is really the way it is, you guys. Hallelujah. We went to a thing the other night, or the other day, uh, Regina and I went at night and then I went the next day to a... Uh, 
the guy is a, a, a major in the Israeli uh, 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 military. He's a major in the military and he does intelligence for the CIA and the FBI. He's an American citizen. He's born in New York, raised in New York, and he went to Israel 31 years ago. And now he's a citizen of Israel and the United States. So he communicates back and forth. And he helps them with terrorist intelligence. Okay, now if you know more than him, that's all right with me. You know, and if you think you know more than him, then then that's okay with me too. I don't know why I wouldn't listen to a guy who's standing, and he said his children had to put on gas masks four times last year because of the bombs coming. For me, that's unacceptable behavior. It's unacceptable living conditions, but they've taken impossible living situation and made him livable. When I saw, I, I got a thing in the mail, and most of you guys saw the guy cutting the guy's head off on YouTube. I don't know about you, I didn't look at it. But I saw, I got a paper from Mari, Mario Cirillo, and he showed a picture of this guy. He has this guy, a man, a grown man, kneeling down in front of him, humiliating him anyway, and then taking him and, and putting a knife to his throat, about to cut his head off. That did something inside of me. It pissed me off. You hear that on YouTube? <coughs> It did. It just did something inside of me and it made me mad. It made me mad inside to think that anybody could, 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 could humiliate a human being like that. A grown man didn't have any guts enough to take his handcuffs off and fight him face to face. It's not right. It's wrong. And people are thinking that is right. Do you understand? That's why we go and preach the gospel to these people. Because we overcome evil with good, not with other evil. The only way to overcome evil is to tell them the truth right. of the gospel. Right. The gospel is good news. To tell them the truth of the gospel and to set in them the principles of the kingdom of God is the, the only reason you have any freedom in this country today is because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The only reason you think that lying is bad because the Bible says it's bad. And your parents taught you that it was bad. And if you think it's right, you've been deceived. And if you think that somebody should humiliate somebody like that, it's just, it's just beyond me. It's just, it was too much for me. We call, so those, we call those people crazy, but they're not crazy, they're unsaved. Yes, absolutely. And so we got to get crazier than them, people. you got to get crazy enough to go into all the world and preach the gospel. They don't know who lives inside They don't know. They don't know. The devil is inside of them. They're children of the devil at this point in time. The Bible calls them the children of the devil. Okay? That's what the Bible calls them. I don't care what you call them. If you think Christ is in there, that's all right with me. But he's not. They call them children of the devil. And so were some of we before we knew him. Now we are children of God, each one of us, because God created us. But by our choices, and by our choices, we make ourselves children of the devil until we come, become children of God by the blood of Christ. If everybody was a child of God already, we wouldn't go preach the gospel to them. We'd just sit home and say, good, I'm glad they're in God. They're not. Some of them people are going to go to hell. And that's the other reason we go and preach the gospel to them. Because they're on their way to hell. A place that burns with fire unquenchable where the worms die not. Amen. That don't get your attention. I don't know what will. That makes me want to live a good life. <laughs> not that I'm saved by living a good life. I'm saved by the blood of the Lamb. But it wants me. It makes me want to live like I actually believe it. That's what this book was saying. Some of us have prayed to prayer, but we haven't... We bought in, but we haven't sold out. Okay? We bought into this thing called the Gospel, but we haven't sold out to it. I want to read you something, just while I'm on this little tangent. <laughs> then I'll start preaching to you guys. Hallelujah. But i got to read this. Um, this. Listen to this. In A.D. 44, King Herod ordered that James the Greater be thrust through with a sword. He was the first of the apostles to be martyred. Not first the disciples, that was Stephen. First the apostles. And so the blood bath began. Luke was hung by the neck from an olive tree in Greece. Doubting Thomas was pierced by a pine spear, tortured with red heart plates, and burned alive in India. In A.D. 54, the proconsul of uh, Hierapolis had Philip tortured and crucified because his wife converted to Christianity while he, they were listening to Philip preach. <laughs> Philip continued to preach even while he was on the cross. 
Matthew was stabbed in the back in Ethiopia. Bartholomew was flogged to death in Armenia. James was just uh, was just just James the Just was thrown off the southeast pinnacle of the temple in Jerusalem. After surviving the 100 foot fall, he was clubbed to death by a mob. Simon the Zealot was crucified uh, by the governor of Syria in AD 74. Judas Thaddeus was beaten to death with sticks in Mesopotamia. Matthias was who replaced Judas Iscariot, was stoned to death and then beheaded. Peter was crucified upside down at his own request. John the Beloved was the only disciple to die of natural causes, but that's only because he survived his own execution. When a cauldron of boiling oil could not kill John, Emperor Diocletian exiled him to the Isle of Patmos, where he lived his, till his death in 95 AD. I want you to know that this gospel, that this, this God that we serve, every one of the apostles got killed. Every one of them. The closer you get to Jesus, the more dangerous it's going to be for you. That's just the way it is. The closer you get to Him, the more dangerous it is for your physical life. Remember the rich young ruler? He came to Jesus and, and he asked Jesus, what can, what can I do to be right with God? He says, do this, do this, do this, don't, don't do that. He says, I've done all these things from my youth. What do I still lack? Here a guy was rich. He says, a rich young ruler, he was running things. It's like my niece. What do you want to be when you grow up? In charge. Okay? So he was in charge. This rich young ruler was in charge. And what, what did he say? There's something missing. There's something missing in me. There's a hole in me. Enough is not enough. Enough can never be enough. You cannot get enough of enough. The more you get the stuff in this world, there's still a hole in you. You, you, you become empty and lonely. You can't get enough friends to make you not lonely. You can't be enough social thing to make you not lonely. In Christ, you may be alone at times, but you're never lonely. That's right. That's right. Hallelujah. I was single till I was 41. I know. I know what it is to be alone and not lonely. That's right. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, where was I going with all that? I forgot. When you come to the place in your life, when all of these things, you realize that the closer I get to Jesus might be dangerous for this body. What did he promise a rich young ruler? Come and follow me. He says, sell all you have, give to the poor, and you will have treasures in heaven. And then he said, come, follow me. He invited him into his inner circle. We forget that part at times. Oh, he had to give all his wealth away. Crazy guy, he had to give all his wealth. No, don't concentrate on that. Look at the offer Jesus made him. Come and get in the inner circle. You walk around with me. The creator of the universe, the one who feeds 5,000 people with a couple of fish and a few loaves of bread. Come and follow me. You, there's a guy, in fact, that got his name written down here. His name is, um, um, what was his name? Soren Kirkegrad. Kirkegrad. He is an Irish philosopher. He believed boredom was the root of all evil. Boredom? Boredom was the root of all evil. He says, once you are in Christ, you are never bored. Yeah, that's right. He says boredom will cause you to go into all kinds of evil. Mm -hmm. That's why we need to, when he says, but if you do something, do it with all your heart as under the Lord. Yeah. And he'll always give you something to do. There will always be purpose in your life. There's no boredom in Christ. People tell me they're bored. When my kids used to tell me I was bored, they are bored. You know what I did to them? I gave them something to do. Yeah. I think they asked me, they told me they are bored about twice in their life, and that was it. Yeah. They said, go out there and dig a hole. They come back in. I said, go down, fill it up. <laughs> Actually, I never did that, but I thought about it. <laughs> but I had him do something. Why? Because boredom is, is unacceptable. It's not, only, it's not only something that shouldn't be. It's something that's, I don't know, it's almost a sin, I would say. Oh, really? Praise the Lord. Okay. I wrote down here, it's not about winning battles against the enemy. Okay? It's about winning them to Christ. Amen. That's right. That's right. 
Now, do I believe in war? Yes. Do I believe there are times when uh, one people will raise up against another people and back up evil <laughs> with, with weapons and guns and kill people that are evil? Absolutely. Yeah. Even uh, Winston Churchill said, he said, yeah, that's great. And uh, C.S. Lewis said one time, he was in World War I, killing guys. And he, and he started smiling to himself one time. He's in a foxhole. He started smiling to himself. He says, what if we both stood up and shot each other at the same time? The enemy and me. He said, and we ended up in heaven together right then. He says, I don't think we'd feel guilty or bummed out or anything like that. Oh, I took a life. He'd, think, he'd, think, he'd actually get a laugh out of the deal. Why? Because when you're fighting in a war, you're fighting for a principle. Or, or an idea, okay? You're fighting against an idea or you're fighting for an idea. And when you fight for that, there's good cause to kill evil people, okay? If I saw somebody across the street about to cut, the, cut your head off, John, I'd shoot him. I would. If I had a gun, I'd shoot him before he cut John's head off because I like John more than I do him. <laughs> I think I would anyway. <clears throat> I've never been in that situation, but I think I would if I saw somebody cross the street pouring gasoline on a little baby and they had a match in their hand, I'd shoot the thing out of his hand and then shoot him in the head. That kind of person needs to die. Or he needs to be converted to another way of thinking. If I could get him saved, I would, but there's some situations, people, that it just doesn't happen. I mean, there was a time in, in, uh, in Hitler's Germany where the Christians finally realized that Hitler wasn't going to change. They tried to change him up until that point. They did everything they could. They went to his constituents, but they finally met with Hitler. And when they realized Hitler was the one who was doing these things, they realized this is not going to change. And you know what their fear was? Not that he'd take over, but Christianity would be no more. That was the fear of the Christians in that day, that Christianity would be wiped out. If Hitler had his way, that's exactly what would have happened. The, the guy needed to die. The guy needed to be taken out. Or converted, I don't care, look at, shoot. I mean, there's a lot of people in history, look at the, uh, oh, it's, yeah, look at Paul. I mean, he was murdering Christians, he's murder, going to murder a bunch of Christians, let's murder Christians. Why? Because they're taking over the world. My God, they're coming against our religion. What's up? By the way, they still are. <laughs> Christians are still coming against religion. Why? Because religion does nothing for a man or a woman's soul. Religion can't get you saved just by going by a set of rules or regulations. How many of you in here ever tried to karma your way out of things? <laughs> Remember that? Remember karma? You know, you do a couple good things and it outweighs the bad things you're doing? Well, my karma never worked because I was always, oh, craps, outweighed the attaboys 10 to 1. Easily. Easily. I really tried to, and I was trying. I was trying to be a good guy. I was trying so hard, <coughs> and I was always being stupid <laughs> and bad. And I, and I thought, what's the matter with me? I'm trying to be good, and I can't be I was like in Paul in Romans 7. The things I want to do, I cannot do, and the things I'm don't want to do, that's the thing I do. What's the matter with me? Oh, thanks be to God, to Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Huh. Hallelujah. Grace is the only thing yeah, I was at a function last night, working this function for the NRA, and it was pretty scary in that room with all those weapons and those guys. But let me tell you, they stopped me in my tracks when they stood up and they gave glory to God uh, for... for you know, the weapons. weapons and their rights, and, and no matter what your beliefs in the NRA are, those men gave glory to God, and it was the most elegant prayer. And I was impressed. There was a room full of Christians with a lot of weapons, but a room full of Christians. Sound <laughs> <laughs> uh, like you were at a Baptist church, right? <laughs> <laughs> How'd you know that Curtis was packing up? Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. That's right. Thank God. You know, when I was a kid, everybody had a gun. Everybody, kids, grown-ups, everybody had a gun. Why? Because you're supposed to have guns. That's right. We thought they were for hunting, but the Constitution said it's for standing up for your rights. I grew up in Texas. Everybody had a gun. Yeah. Well, the old women 
had guns. Yeah, this is Nevada. Same goes here. <laughs> it's true. A guy, I was at a conference one time and this guy was talking and he, he said, I saw you're wearing a knife. I said, you know, and what I was thinking is, yeah, it's a Smith & Wesson. This is Nevada. <laughs> I just, I put it in the truck. Wait. Gun control, that's ridiculous. I, I just, am I not going to get off on that? Sit on YouTube. Uh, I don't believe in gun control. <laughs> The thing they're trying to control is not guns. The thing they're trying to control is people. Yeah, yeah, that's, right. and that's a good idea. You know, go, go get the criminals. But give every, every God-fearing person a gun so when a guy comes into a school and starts shooting people, a guy can shoot him before he kills six or seven other kids. Mm -hmm. You know the teacher ought to be packing. Mm -hmm. That's what I think. Uh, are we getting too political in church? No. <laughs> you know, I can do this. I can lobby for 12 minutes on every service. <laughs> I can. I can lobby 12 minutes out of every service. It's in, the it's, in the, it's in the law. So I haven't spent 12 minutes yet anyway. They're doing that. <laughs> the Bible says, um, he says, um, they shall call evil good and good evil. There'll come a day when they'll call good evil and evil good. What is cutting the head off somebody and thinking it's good? That's calling evil good. That says in there that... The, they will think they're doing God a favor by killing you. It says right in the Word, it's being fulfilled today, exactly what they said. Now, it has been fulfilled in history past? Yes, absolutely. I mean, shoot. Even, even the Christians at one time thought they ought to go kill people if they didn't believe. I mean, look at the Crusades. That's what the Muslims call Christians, you know, Crusaders. The Muslim Brotherhood, they call Christians Crusaders. Yeah. And we have been, yeah, it, it, to our detriment for sure. Uh, the Bible says don't return evil for evil, but overcome evil with good. So if anybody's listening on YouTube or whatever, I'm not talking about shooting back. I'm talking about going and loving people until they, until they come to a place where they're sane again where they think forgiveness is better than revenge, where they think that uh, do unto others as you would have others do unto you. When they come to a place where love is more powerful than hate, when they come to a place where, see, these are principles in the Bible. These are principles in the kingdom of God. It, it, the Bible is it's an inside, upside, inside, outside, upside down kingdom. It is. At least. Yeah. Maybe this will make me some enemies. Everybody likes me. You know, I've been worried about that. The Bible says if everybody likes you, you better watch it. It says in Matthew 24, 12, that the love of many will wax cold because iniquity will abound. I want you to know that in our lives, Regina and my life, um, one out of a hundred people say thank you that we help. Used to be like that anyway. is isn't so much like that anymore. Because people have got the idea that one out of a hundred people would say thank you when you helped them. One out of a hundred. I'm not exaggerating. Thank you. <laughs> Hallelujah. But we were looking for thank yous, otherwise we would have quit at 72. <laughs> okay. But the love of many will wax cold because iniquity will abound. People will begin to cut people's heads off and, and persecute you and say bad things about you for Christ's sake. They'll do all those things. We're not impressed with that. We're not living for somebody else's way to go anyway. I'm looking for God to say, well done, good and faithful servant. Come on into the presence of the Lord. These, these, this uh, instant gratification, I, I'm, I'm saving my gratification for later on. I trade it in this life for the next one. If you trade in this life for the next one, what you'll get out of it is a thing called amazing. Consecration always leads to amazing. Any time you give your whole life to Christ, like He's given, like the song we sang, I will give my life, like He gave your life, I'll give my life. Every time you do that, there's amazing comes out of that. Mm -hmm. God will do the impossible for you. Absolutely impossible things happen. Who all here has ever had anything impossible happen? Oh, you should pan around. A lot of people rose their hands. Okay, the Bible says to overcome evil with good in Romans 12, 20, 21. In 1 Peter 3, 9, it says, Not rendering evil for evil, but rather good, for this you are called to. 
We're called to do good to those who do evil to us. Even Jesus said, if somebody slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other also. If somebody demands that you go a mile with them, go too. If somebody wants your coat, give them your shirt too. What are you hanging on to your stuff for? Hallelujah. This is a balancing act, though. You've got to watch it. Because to, in fact, I wrote it down here. It, um, this is a balancing act. It, it's an art rather than a hard, fast rule. How to do good and not enable somebody. It's, 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 a, it's a thing with us all the time. How to do people good without enabling them just to stay the way they are. And to be stupid and do... I mean, we've had people in the back of our church living back here uh, inviting whores over, taking Valium, getting drunk. Yeah. Yeah. What's wrong with that? Taking Valium, getting drunk, or the whores? Uh, no, it happens all the time. Yeah, it does happen all the time. And uh, we've had other people do terrible things. And and what do we do? We try to help people. We try to help them not to be so stupid. And and so we talk to them about Christ. We talk to them about the ways of God. We talk to them about the kingdom of God. Sometimes you think that you're good just because you're good. I'm sorry, you're good maybe because. God did something in your life. Amen. Hallelujah. Um, I would like to read this to you too. Oh, where did that book go that I had? Oh, here it is. <clears throat> now, we, we did this as a video series on Wednesdays. It's called All In. And it's just talking about giving your all to Christ. Uh, we might do it as a Bible study later. I'm not sure. The more I read it, some of it I like, some of it I don't like. Okay, I'll read that one. That's good. Praise the Lord. Oh, page 35. Sorry. Mm -hmm. i got to read this to you. This is good. You guys bored yet? No. No, <laughs> no way, man. That's a sin. <laughs> hey, if the preacher's boring and you go to sleep, that is not your fault. That's the preacher's fault. Hallelujah. I just want to read this to you. Some of you heard this story uh, on Wednesday, but I'm just going to read it to you. On July 2nd, 1863, Chamberlain and his 300 soldier regiment were all that stood between the Confederates and certain defeat on the battlefield of Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. At 2.30 p.m. on the 15th, 40, in the 47th Alabama Infantry regiments of the Confederate Army charged, but Chamberlain and his men held their ground. Then followed a second and third and fourth and fifth charge. By the last charge, only 80 blues stood standing. Chamberlain himself was knocked down by a bullet that hit his belt buckle. But the 34-year-old school teacher got right back up. This guy is, anyway, okay. It was uh, the date of destiny. When Sergeant Tozier informed Chamberlain that no reinforcements were coming for his men, they were down to one round of ammunition per soldier. Chamberlain knew that he needed to act decisively. Their lookout, a young boy perched high on a tree on Little Round Top, informed Colonel Chamberlain that the Confederates were forming rank. The rational thing to do at this point, with no ammunition and no reinforcements, right. that's right, man, surrender, do something. But Chamberlain wasn't <coughs> wired that way. He made a defining decision to turn the tide of the war and single-handedly save the Union. The full, in full view of the enemy, Chamberlain climbed, into their, uh, Chamberlain climbed onto their barricade of stones and gave a command. He pointed his sword and yelled, Charge! <laughs> his men fixed their bayonets and started running at the Confederate Army, which vastly outnumbered them, then caught off guard they executed a right, great right wheel, and in the ranks of the one of the most important victories in the military history, 80 Union soldiers captured 4,000 Confederates in five minutes flat. Wow. What? Ah. What? <laughs> what seemed to be a suicide mission saved the Union. Historians believe that if Chamberlain had not charged, the rebels, rebels would have gained the high ground. If the rebels had gained the high ground, there's a good chance that they had won the battle at Gettysburg. If the rebels had won the battle, the historical consensus is that the Confederates would have won the war. One man's courage saved the day, saved the war, and saved the Union. 
Listen to this little proverb. For the want of a nail, a shoe was lost. For want of a shoe, a horse was lost. For want of a horse, a rider was lost. For want of a rider, the message was lost. For want of the message, the battle was lost. For want of the battle, the kingdom was lost. And for all that want of a horse, a <coughs> one horseshoe nail. But what was it that Chamberlain said later when they asked him? I'm going to read that. Good for you. After the war, Joshua Chamberlain went on to serve 30, as the 32nd governor of Maine and the president of his alma mater, Baldwin College. In 1893, 30 years after his act of heroism, he was awarded the Medal of Honor by President Grover Cleveland and holding his position on the little round top against the repeated assaults and carrying the advancing and carrying the advanced position of the great round top. In his later years, Chamberlain would reflect back on the war with these words. I had, quote, I had deep within me the inability to do nothing. I knew I may die, but I also knew that I would not die with a bullet in my back. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's so cool. <laughs> so, are we all in for Jesus? Are we all in for Jesus? Yes. What is the thing that's bugging you right now? What is the thing that's getting to you? Okay, what are you running from? What are you about to run from? Uh, Captain America. Remember Captain America? I don't know if you guys watched the movie. I loved it because it was about America. But Captain America, he was a little skinny guy when he first started out, and then they enhanced him and he became Captain America. But he was a little skinny guy. And he was in Fight in the Alley. And this guy was pounding the crap out of him. Just frown. He'd get up and he'd knock him down. He says, why don't you stay down? And he gets up and he says, I could do this all day. <laughs> now that's the kind of attitude we need, man. I can do this all day. Go ahead. Take your best shot. I mean, that's the kind of attitude we need to serve Jesus Christ, I'll tell you that. Okay. The unwillingness to give up. So are, what are you trying to break... Are you trying to break even spiritually by, by avoiding sin? <laughs> well, a lot of us are just trying to avoid sin, and that breaks us even spiritually. Are you running a mission a yard from the gates of hell instead? Remember Cortez, who conquered much of the South America continent? They speak Spanish there, by the way. In Mexico, they speak Spanish there. Why? Because Cortez... Okay, anyway burned the ships. What did Cortez do? When he landed on the shore, his men were kind of weirded out because every other exploration of that land ended up bad. He had like a hundred or like two hundred soldiers with him and that was it. And there was five million indigenous people that he was going to fight against. And so what did he do? He burnt the ships. So they couldn't go back. I want you to know his men would probably kind of pushed out of shape at him at first. Now, the disciples also left their ships and followed Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. Remember when they left their boats and followed the Lord? Mm -hmm. What did they do later on? <laughs> That's right. What did Peter say? Hey, let's go fishing. Mm -hmm. They should have burned the boats. Mm -hmm. Thank God that Jesus was on the shore. I wrote down here, um, thank God Jesus was on the shore or there'd still be a Peter, James, and John fishing company today on Galilee. <laughs> right? But the boats weren't the only thing they had to, that had to go that day. Peter had to leave his past failures behind him. He had to burn that boat. Because Peter was about to be uh, like Judas Iscariot, kind of. Weeping bitterly, couldn't get his act together, going to go fishing instead, I'm back to what I was, I'm not an apostle anymore, I'm just a fisherman. Peter took him on the shore, he says, Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Feed my lambs. Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. In other words, Peter, I'm commissioning you again. I'm, I'm, I'm burn the stinking past. I wrote down here, how about you? What's, what do you need to burn? Your past failures? your past successes, some old habit, some guilt you're carrying around, some regret you have from the past. All we need to do probably is just start. We used to run 10, 15 miles a day, my brother and I. And you know the hardest part of running 10 miles a day? Starting our starting steps. steps. Getting them shoes on and taking the first step. Once you get out the door, takes first steps, fine. That's it. That's it. Um, uh, Mark Batterson says, the only way to predict the future is to create it. 
He says, if the pain of staying where you are is greater than the pain of change, then you can begin to change. Just got to take the first step. So what is your first step? By the way, indecision is a decision. That's right. Yeah. So I have decided today not to decide. <laughs> and one other thing. Are you willing to start from where you are? Are you willing to start from where you are? Whatever your thing is. Okay, are you willing to burn the ships, draw a line in the sand? Okay, today is the first day of the rest of my life. Here I come. That's it. First day of the rest of my life. Here I come. All of that doesn't matter to me anymore. Well, I've been... I've been, you know, I've been trying to get in shape for 20 years. What have you done? Well, I haven't done anything, but I've been, you know, I've been, I've been wanting to. to. I've been going to start, you know. <laughs> I told somebody the other day, I said, just walk to a, the first telephone pole and back. Now, now, uh, <laughs> um, uh, Wojtek, he got to go get his knee operated on so he can move around again. But I told my, I, t I forget who I told, I'm not going to tell on anybody, so. I said, walk to the first telephone pole. The next day, walk to the second telephone pole. And at the same time, do 10 push-ups. The next day, do 11. The next day, do 12. The next day, do 13. The next day, do 14. The next day, do 15. By the time you're up to 30, you will be able to do the 30. Guarantee it. And every time you walk to a different telephone pole, pretty soon you'll be walking a mile and a half, two miles a day. How do you do it? You, do, you don't go out and walk the mile and a half the first day. You walk to the first telephone pole. Otherwise, you're going to be so sore tomorrow, you won't be able to get out of bed. <laughs> Especially when you're a little, a little older, you know. Hallelujah. Now, if you're young, don't take that. If you're young, when I came back from the service, when I came back, my, my brother said, hey, let's go on a run. And I thought, oh, good, before we, you know, let's go on a run, all right. And I was really out of shape because I didn't do nothing in the service. <laughs> so he takes me on this run, 15-mile run. I thought I was going to die. <laughs> I did, but I didn't want to be a wimp, you know. So <laughs> I just kept running, and we ran out the old, the old uh, freeway out there in North Reno there. We ran all the way out and over and up and on the end and down. 15 miles, by the time I got back, I was in shape. I went through soreness, I went through all the pain, I went through, I went through everything by the time I got back I was in shape so I, you know, the next day I went and ran 5, 15 miles again. So if you're young, those, those things don't count. But, it, but if you wouldn't have grabbed me and said, put your shorts on and get your shoes on, let's take a run, I would have been out of shape for the rest of the time. I wouldn't, I would have went out. I asked a guy one time, how do you run long distance? I've been running 5 miles a day for like 2 years. He says, the next time you go out, you go out as far as you usually do, and then go twice as far. <laughs> a lot of times in your Christian life, you've been going so far, you've been going so far, you've been going so far. What you need to do is take a mad, crazy leap of courage and do something radical that takes you twice as far as you ever were. The little teeny weeny things sometimes don't happen. Sometimes it's to the next telephone pole. Sometimes it's a 15 mile run. Okay? you got to make up your mind what God is calling you to. And a lot of times that 15 mile run is what you really need. Because going all in with Christ is not a, a little thing at a time. Okay. Let us quit living. This is Mark Batterson again. He says, let's quit living as if the purpose of our life was to arrive safely at death. <laughs> I just love that. I think I, I live that way sometimes. Okay. Goodness is not the absence of badness. You can do nothing wrong and still do nothing good. Okay. All right. Now to the sermon. Praise the Lord. What time is it? You got any time? Okay. Yeah, we do. It's only like 10, 924. The guy in the back says, the game's going to be on here pretty quick. Cool. Isn't it? <laughs> See, somebody knows. Regina's sister, she follows football. I never knew a girl who followed football before. She followed football. You two, too. Huh? You're weird also. All right. <laughs>
One way to get started. Don't say things that describe your situation. Use words that change your situation. That's right. That's good. That's good. That's good. That's good. It's just how to start. How to start. How do I start? How do I start? Life and death are in the power of the tongue. Right. Okay? Life so and death true. are in the power of the tongue. Anyone can go through life just stating the obvious or stating facts. Mm -hmm. Okay? Or prophesying bad things about your future. Mm. It's going to be a bad day. I'm tired of dealing with those kids. I'm tired of dealing with my boss. I'm tired of dealing with my employees. I'm just tired of that stuff. Instead of saying that, you can say, man, it's going to be a good day. Hallelujah. Something good is going to take place today. Yeah. I'll have you. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sick. I'm gonna get healed. That's right. I, I might feel sick today, but oh, Lord, I God, I'm going to church get healed. Hallelujah. Come on. There's right. some people down there got faith. They, they lay hands on me. I get well. Right. Praise the Lord. There. Yeah. You get out of bed in the morning. You just don't feel up to it. I want you to know this morning. I did not feel up to it. So when I don't feel up to it, I figure I'm a leader. Okay. So if I don't feel up to it, maybe everybody else doesn't. Maybe I'm going through something and I need to press through just to help somebody else get to where I need to go. Amen. You're leading somebody somewhere every day. You are a leader. You are, you are a mentor for someone. I hope you are a mentor for someone. So therefore, you need to teach them how to break through. There's a lot of guys that, that stand in a service and they'll get a pain in their knee. They don't have pains in their knee. So they say, uh, has anybody got a pain in their knee? And some people, yeah, that's me. Well, come up here. I'm going to pray for you. God's going to heal you. So if you have a pain in your heart, if you have pain in your emotions, sometimes that's not for you. That's right. That's right. That's right. It's for somebody else. So I figured when I got up this morning, other people are going to feel just like me. And I had to minister to somebody who didn't want to get out of bed this morning, did not want to get into the Word, did not want to go uh, sing praises to God with my hands. And I don't feel like it. There's a, uh, a thing I read about a guy, I told uh, Chris and his guys this morning this, a guy went through his wedding vows, right, just beautiful wedding, went through his wedding vows, and he came to the, he came to the pastor right after the wedding vows, he says, pastor, pastor, I got to talk to you, he gets him aside, he says, pastor, I just don't feel like I'm married. The pastor grabbed him by the shirt collar, says, listen boy, you're married, it doesn't matter, you feel like you're married, you're married, you took the vows. <laughs> he snapped out of it. <laughs> Hallelujah. You are what you are. You got to. Hallelujah. So you don't say it's going to bad. Yep. And let, I wrote down here. Yep. I knew when I said it was going to be a good day that it would turn out bad. <laughs> Nobody's ever thought that before, I imagine. Just uh, sick ones. When one door closes, God will open another one. Amen. Probably a better one. Yes. Hallelujah. Are you that guy, that negative guy that says, yep. I knew when I started confessing good, I was gonna, things were going to turn out bad. Are you the kind of guy that says, whoop, I started confessing to them, all my needs are met by Christ Jesus, and all of a sudden I was broke. And I knew it was going to happen. I just knew it. Good, I'm glad you're not like that. I'm, the, I'm just a little sick of my head sometimes. Okay. Oh, well, how about this one? Oh, I got another pain. It's probably because I'm getting old. Ooh. Boy. Don't do that. No. Don't do that. Yeah, I'm telling you, man. That's right. <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> now, now, we can talk our problems all day long, or we can talk solutions. Okay? Well, there goes the offer. <laughs> now, what you have to believe, though, <laughs> what you have to believe, do you believe Jesus is interested in your success? Yes. Oh. You believe that Jesus is inter interested in the little teeny weeny things you're going through. Yes. Hallelujah. If you believe that, then you believe some other things he said about you. You can read, um, in fact, we ought to go, you want to look up a couple of scriptures for me? Psalm 5, 11 and 12. Somebody say yes. Okay. Yes. okay. Mm -hmm. Psalm 35 through 7. I got that one. Proverbs 12, 1 and 2. I got it. Okay. Luke 252. I got it. Okay. Start with Psalm 5, 11, and 12. But let all who take refuge <clears throat> in you be glad. Let them ever sing for joy. And you may and may you shelter them 
that those who know your name will exalt you. For it is you who blesses the righteous man, O Lord. You surround him with favor as with a shield. Ooh, wow. surround him with favor as with a shield. So you get up in the morning tomorrow and read that song and say, I am favored by God. Oh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, Psalm 30, 5 through 7. <laughs> His anger is but for a moment. His favor is for life. Hallelujah. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Amen. Amen. Now, in your pros prosperity, I said, I shall never be moved. Lord, by your favor, you have made me, you have made my mountain stand strong. Hold right there. See, David was saying, in my prosperity, I said I would never be moved. And then he says, by your favor, Lord. That's how it really works. You go ahead and finish that sentence. You hid your face, and I was troubled. I cried out to you, O Lord, and to the Lord I made supplication. What private is there in my blood? When I go down to the pit, will the dust praise you? Will it declare your truth? Hear it, O Lord, and have mercy on me. Lord, be my helper. You have turned my morning into dancing. What he said. <laughs> you have put off my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness. Amen. That's good. That's good. You get the point. You get the point. Yes. Hallelujah. Proverbs 12, 1 and 2. That's a good one. Whoso loveth instruction loveth knowledge, but he that hateth reproof is brutish. Mm -hmm. A good man obtaineth favor of the Lord, but a wicked but a man yeah, but a man of wickedness, of uh, wicked devices, he will condemn. A good man receives favor from the Lord. Mm -hmm. Now, Luke 252, in case you think you're not favored by God, or something like that. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature, and in favor with God and man. Jesus, the Son of God, increased in favor with God. You get that? I don't know about you, but that turns me off. I can increase in favor with God. As you begin to walk with God, and you begin to obey Him and do the things that He says to you, God can trust you more and more and more. Right. And He begin to do things through you more. Right. It's when you say no to God, or when you back off or say, oh, I'm just not worthy today. I'm feeling too bad today. I'm just, I'm just not up to it today. Get up tomorrow morning and say, I'm favored by I, God. Yeah. Yeah. I, he's going to be a shield around me. I can do anything yeah. God calls yeah. me to do. He is my king. Uh, also, Oh, I, I do this in parking lots. If I really wanna, if I really want a uh, parking place, I just say, I get in the parking lot. I remember, I go, oh yeah, favor. Yep. And I mean, nine times out of ten, there it is. Yep. Right there. I mean, I could be driving around a parking lot for twenty minutes, and I'll say the word favor, yep. and all that means to my mind and to God when he and that parking plot right in there. <laughs> <laughs> or I could just walk around cheap or, or, you know you can do the you can do the other part okay I have oh by the way you I do not only have the grace from God I have the grace of God in other words I can be gracious to other people not only do I have everything that God gives me free and appropriate that by faith I can have other people come to me and I am gracious and I'll give them what they do not deserve. Ooh, yeah, okay, okay. I am a kind person, I'm full of wisdom. I am a very grateful sort. I am full of faith, I believe God can do anything. God wants to bless me in a big way and in the tiniest little ways. <laughs> By the way, please don't play act with Jesus. <coughs> You can hang out with him. He's okay. He's not impressed. You know, you don't, you know, Jesus is coming over. Better shower and shave and clean up the house and 
and get the bathroom cleaned up. You know, you go in there and hang the towels up. No, Jesus wants to hang out with you when you're letting your hair down. You people that have hair. Okay. Otherwise, what happens? Otherwise, what happens? The word says, and it says, "Thy kingdom come, or thine is the kingdom, thine is the power, and thine is the glory." If you get your act together, whose glory does it? Yes. Yeah. If you get your act together, right. that's your glory. Okay, now watch this. It's His goodness, it's His glory, it's His grace. Calvary bought that for you and got you into God's family, and it wasn't because of your effort. You were probably kicking and screaming the whole stinking way. Okay? We want God to get the glory here, all right? Yeah. So as we submit to His will and to His grace and find out who we are in Him, all of a sudden, He starts getting the glory. Uh, but I must keep His commandments. We like to get off on that one, especially as law people. I want you to know, the Bible says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So what are you focusing on? Keeping His commandments or falling in love with Jesus? If you love Him, you will keep His commandments. That's what the Word says. Okay. Um, 1 Corinthians 15.10 says, but by the grace of God I am what I am. And then it says, I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Isn't that good? Amen. Okay. In Joseph, in Genesis 39, we see Joseph in prison. He's been thrown in prison. He's been got by his brothers. Hi, guys. He's been brought in by his brothers. He's in trouble. Okay, and what does the Bible say about him? He says, and Joseph was a successful man. So, success doesn't mean I got it all. I got all the material things. I got everything. No, success means you got God. Because when Joseph was in there, he was called a successful man. He had Jesus, and that's all he needed to make him a successful person. I want you to know that there are people all over the earth that... Uh, for a while were buying one-way tickets to the mission field. They were going to the worst, nastiest, terrible places on earth and they knew they'd die there. They knew they'd die, so they bought one-way tickets. Isn't that cool? That's the kind of God you serve. They're going over there to plant a bit of the gospel into somebody's life so that, what we said at the first, so they might live a peaceable life. In order to change people, you've got to go, how do you get a sick person well? Or how do you, how do you heal the sick? Okay. How do you heal the sick? How do you get sick healed? Find a sick person and pray for them. Okay. You've got to find a sick person and pray for them. You don't go to the well people. And Jesus says, I don't come for the righteous to be saved. I come for the sinners. I come for the people who are sick. You know, I come for the people who need something. You didn't come for the self-righteous folks. So in order to per get a person healed, you've got to find a sick one. In order to get somebody saved, you're going to have to find a sinner. Oh, I just work with a bunch of stinking sinners. I think I'm going to have to quit my job and get another job because these people are just terrible over there. <laughs> well, you're probably in the right spot. You're probably in the right spot. Go get them saved. Preach to them till they fire you. You don't have to say, take this job and shove it. You can just say, Jesus is Lord every day. Lord of God, thank you, Jesus. Oh man, it's a great thing to do. I'm glad I'm here. God has sent me here for you, you slow lap sucker. You know. All right. You don't want to say it that way. No, you probably don't. All right. <laughs> Jesus, Jesus is still a Savior. He didn't only save you from your sins. He saves you from all kinds of stuff. Okay? He's still a Savior. His name is Savior. His name is Emmanuel. God with us. So if God is with you, you are successful. Okay? This is the way it works. Okay? So you don't have to play. Uh, yeah, you don't have to play act with God. Okay. So where did I start here? Okay. The, where I started was, go make disciples of all the nations. And then I read, it's not only for their sakes that we go, but it's for our sakes. Okay, so they might, we might live a quiet and peaceable life. I don't know about you, but I like quiet. Regina and I went down to the river here not too long ago, and we got down by the river there, and we stopped. And we turned off the car, and it was quiet. We went, oh, 
oh yeah, I remember this. Because <laughs> we live in a place that's not quiet. There's always noise. In fact, one night I went outside and it was like dead, still quiet, and I could hear way down the block over there. And I thought, what's going on? This is different. I thought something spooky was going on, right? And I realized that cellite had stopped. Cellite stopped running. So cellite makes a lot of noise. It does make a lot of noise, but it makes enough noise so it isn't quiet. But when they were off, you could tell the difference. So I, I, I immediately called Wes George because he, he runs the place. And I told him, hey, your plant's down. I mean, this was late at night. I had to tell him his plan. He says, yeah, it's something busted, so we had to shut her down. Isn't that something? So we forget what quiet, and the Bible says that we might live a quiet and peaceable life. I want to live that peaceable life. I want to come to church without somebody throwing rocks at me. I want to go and, and fellowship and sing out here. I want to go out here and talk to people about Christ. I want to give pe uh, food away at the pantry and be able to pray for people and not feel weird about it. Right. Or not feel like I'm going to get shot. I want you to know some places on this earth, if you talk to people about Jesus and try to pray for them, especially if you put your hands on them, mm. holy cats, they're going to shoot you. Yeah. They're going to shoot you. So it's kind of exciting living in a country like this where we don't have to do that. So anyway, so let's pray. Father, I thank you today that you are the king. Ain't nobody like you. Never been anybody like you. You are always good. Always. And so, Lord, we submit ourselves to you today. Lord, lead us into this world and guide us to be able to talk to somebody who just doesn't know, who just has no, not a clue. And I pray that you'd set that up for us this week, Lord, and help us not to judge them, but to be compassionate and kind. Help us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. That's good. So, oh, we're going uh, to do the offering. Of course, I don't have the thing. Hey, uh, Caprice is gone. She got the thing. So this is the thing today. Will you find it? Oh, here it is. Never mind. <laughs> Lord, we thank you for allowing us to give today. I thank you that uh, Chris's tithe check didn't bounce this week, so we had heat when we came in. Thank you, Lord. thank you, Lord, for this. And we give abundantly. We're happy to do it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Chris came in, it was cold in here today, he says, comes up real serious, he goes, my tie check, my tie check, clear? <laughs> I said, no, it's just a little slow, a little slow. Somebody need to know preacher. Huh? Somebody need to know preacher. Somebody need to know preacher. <laughs> I wouldn't know anyway. I don't. I don't take care of it. Chan takes care of that. She does the banking. Thank you. Thank God. Some other girls do the counting. Honey, you give me a check and put it in my back pocket. Probably get washed. No job. <laughs> oh, so God bless you all. Have just the groovy day. See you, Myron. Bye, guys.